the University of Hong Kong's Global Health and Humanities Book Talk series, uh, which is co-hosted by the Center for the Humanities and Medicine, based in the Faculty of Arts here at HKU, as well as the Medical Ethics and Humanities Unit, based in uh, the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, and so we're really thrilled today uh, to be featuring uh, author uh, Dr. Scott Stonington, who is an MD, uh, PhD uh, in anthropology, so really bridging the arts and humanities with medicine, so really a perfect speaker uh, for our series and our event today. Uh, and Dr. Stonington is an assistant professor of anthropology and internal medicine at the University of Michigan. Uh, and he uh, also works as a hospitalist at the VA Medical Center, as well as a primary care physician at the Neighborhood Family Health Center, uh, also in Michigan. And uh, Dr. Stonington has published extensively in both social medicine and anthropology. And most recently, uh, he's the lead editor of Case Studies in Social Medicine, uh, featured in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine, which is the very first series in a major medical journal devoted to social theory. So we're really excited to feature him today. Uh, and we're also really lucky uh, to have uh, an amazing discussant to engage uh, with Dr. Stonington today. We are uh, featuring Professor Jean Langford, uh, who is Professor Emerita of Cultural Anthropology at the University of Minnesota. And, um, Professor Langford is the author of multiple books, including Consoling Ghosts, Stories of Medicine and Mourning from Southeast Asians in Exile, which was published by Duke in 2013, as well as Fluent Bodies, which is my favorite one of her books, um, Ayurvedic Remedies for Postcolonial Imbalance, uh, which was also published in Duke in 20. Uh, 2002, which I teach all the time in my classes, uh, and of course, numerous articles like Dr. Stonington. And her, she's currently working on a new book manuscript in progress uh, called Animal Belongings, Improvising Life in Captivity, which explores the psychic creativity of sanctuary animals as it emerges through practices of care and self-care. And today, what we'll be doing is having a dialogue between Dr. Stonington uh, and Professor Langford. And uh, Dr. Stonington will be talking about his new book, The Spirit Ambulance, Choreographing the End of Life in Thailand, uh, which was published in 2020 by the University of California Press. And uh, his book was just awarded honorable mention for the prestigious Sharon Stevens First Book Prize uh, by the American Ethnolo Ethnological Society. So we're really lucky to be able to hear uh, from him directly. And so before I turn over the camera uh, to Dr. Stonington, I just wanted to let everybody know that today we're planning to record the uh, delivered talk as well as the formal discussion uh, by Professor Langford. And afterwards, we will give everybody in the audience the option whether or not you want the discussion, uh, the, a more open question and answer period to be recorded. If anybody has any objections to recording, uh, please write to me in the chat. You can write directly to me and we will not record it. Uh, or if you're open and it's okay with you, then if there's no objections, we'll go ahead and record the chat. So we just wanted to let everybody know about that. So I will start uh, the recording, I think, actually, or Adrian, I think you are the recorder. Could you record? I'm not really sure where the button is. Okay, here I, oh, it's already recording. Is it recording? Okay. It's already recording. Okay, great. Sorry about that. I'm like, I just switched a new computer. So I'm now on a laptop and can only see like three panels at a time. But let me turn things over. Thank you everybody for joining us at all hours of the morning and the night. It's 8.30 a.m. here in uh, Hong Kong. And uh, Dr. Stonington is joining us in his evening. I think it's 7.30 there. And uh, Professor Langford, I think is on uh, West Coast Pacific time. And I think it's uh, late afternoon for you. So thank you so much to everybody for coming in and logging in from all all over the world. Uh, so without further ado, let me turn it over to um, Dr. Simington. Great. Thank you so much for inviting me to this space and for um, recruiting Dr. Langford to be part of this, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, uh, and I, this just seems like such a vibrant space that I'm such, it's such an honor and to see all of these fabulous names of people popping into this um, room together. 
So the first thing I wanted to say is, um, I don't know how many folks in this community are connected to Paul Farmer, but I just wanted to mention that um, a very prominent MD, PhD anthropologist who was one of my mentors passed away yesterday and it was pretty shocking news. And um, I spent a lot of the day yesterday and today writing obituaries and working with the various communities. And so I just wanted to, to mention that since um, it may, since there may be anthropologists in the audience and that may be on some of our minds. Um, and since we'll be talking about death and dying, I think it's important to bring um, whatever emotive space we're actually part of that is connected to that into the room. Um, and then I also wanted to say I'm particularly excited today to work with Professor Langford because the path to writing a book is very long and it's particularly long for an MD PhD and I wrote this book before I went into my medical residency, which means I wrote it a long time ago and one of for me one of the regrets or tragedies of that is that I didn't get to work with Professor Langford's um, materials from Consoling Ghosts, which deal, deals brilliantly and beautifully with lots of the same themes that um, appear in the spirit ambulance. Um, and so today is my, is my chance to start um, seeing if we can pull some of our materials into a dialogue because uh, Professor Langford is one of my great anthropological heroes. So thank you for being here. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna share some slides because I think um, one of the benefits of doing the Zoom thing is that we get to um, share in some of the images that are connected to things that we may have been reading in text. Um, and if you don't mind, it's just going to take me a moment to get you all back on a panel where I can see everybody. So hold on. Thank you for your patience. I like to still be able to look at the faces of those who have their cameras on. So anybody who feel, feels expired to have your camera on, it's great for me to be able to connect with you. So my structure for today's talk is I pulled out um, a thread that runs through the book that I will be talking about, which some of you may have encountered. Um, but it's a thread that I think um, in my mind and in my imaginary connects um, richly to Professor Langford's own work. Um, so I'm hoping that it'll start a dialogue. And it's also a thread that brings us into some big questions and questionings about some of the fundamentals of Western bioethics. And so I think for your center, this could be a rich sort of um, terrain for us to think um, both pragmatically and theoretically about some of the stuff we do in biomedicine and thinking about it in a social scientific way. So the book that we're talking about today is my book, The Spirit Ambulance. I like showing the cover, partly because the cover is an artist's rendition of one of the scenes that takes place in the book. Um, and it is uh, a, a book that is intended to be very narrative and to bring folks in an image-oriented kind of way into the experiences of crafting end of life um, in Thailand. And we will be talking today a little bit about image, so I thought it would be worth um, starting with this image introduction. Um, but what I want to talk about today is actually something that I don't discuss directly in the book but is an opening that I think will help us draw a lot of threads together. And it's a, a bit of an introduction to something core in um, religious studies in Thailand, which is the concept of what um, my colleague here in, in Michigan calls the transduction of form that takes place in particular religious practices and systems. And anybody who has been to Thailand has probably encountered some of the iconic versions of transduction of form. And just telling you about those iconic versions will help me get less abstract about what that term means. And in ritual contexts, particularly in monastic settings in Thailand, um, there are formal ways in which spiritual power that is generated potentially through practices that are not fully material in their own right can be transferred between locations and objects and people. And in Thailand, part of how um, this is transferred is through these small white threads called saisin that my Thai friends describe as like electric wires for spiritual power. And monks will sit, and the more monks who are doing some kind of activity that generates a morally derived spiritual power, the more power is generated. So if monks are chanting, or monks are meditating, um, or monks are engaging 
an exchange of material gifts that generates merit and positive outcomes and positive consequences for all involved. They have this white thread connecting their hands to one another and then ultimately to these material objects. So here is a photograph of monks sitting and chanting and holding these white threads. And then the threads are all connected to these Buddha statues, which are material repositories for the morally derived spiritual power that is generated through these activities. And so these Buddha statues accumulate spiritual power over time um, through this part of this ritual process. So in this, I'm sort of making an artificial distinction between material and immaterial and physical and metaphysical, because this is really just a kind of transfer of power from one place to another or one activity to another. And action is a big part of this, the stuff that people do, whether in this situation that's meditating or chanting, et cetera. So why am I going on this detour into Thai religious studies? Because my work, a big part of what's happening in the spirit ambulance is a study of um, how this system of transduction of form has gotten intimately entangled in the development of a super high-tech modern biomedicine in Thailand. And that's the story I wanna talk about today. So the field work for this book is in the north of Thailand in Chiang Mai. Um, and it is a giant metropolis. I mean, not as giant as the metropolis that you guys are in right now, but anyway, it's a giant-ish metropolis. It's all somewhere between a huge city and a college town. Um, and it is right butting up against the mountains that leap very high up from, from Chiang Mai, the valley that it's in. Um, and so it has this kind of urban rural mixed divide sense to it that people talk about. And actually in a lot of Thai culture, the urban rural divide forms this kind of central iconic imaginary of a lot of people's lives. Um, I'm not saying that it is, an, it is a real division, but people talk about it a lot. So um, people in the city will talk about their grandparents who are rice farmers out in, in the countryside right side, outside of town. And one of the iconic images that has come to stand in for this technology is the biomedical hospital. And in particular, within the biomedical hospital, it's intensive care. And Thailand has, over the last 20-ish years, rapidly built up this very high-tech, um, high-powered um, Western biomedical hospital system that has become the sort of center of medical tourism for a lot of the Middle Eastern countries and for a lot of the world. Um, and as part of that, people often talk about the high-tech ICU as the um, the place where this clash of cultures happens, this clash of rural and urban and modern and pre-modern. Again, I'm telling you, these are sort of these tropes that emerge in, in Thai discourse. So for example, in lots of soap operas, there are scenes that happen in the intensive care unit because, I mean, soap operas love intensive care units everywhere because it's like the site of high drama and suddenly somebody's on the deathbed and all the family drama comes out. But also because it's sort of this place where a lot of this stuff that is imagined to clash um, in these, these interfaces between pre-modern and, pre and modern um, come to, to fruition in people's families and in their drama. And so Thailand has rapidly built up access at least to the high-tech intensive care unit at the end of life. But at the same time, um, there, is an, there is a sort of pre-existing ethical framework, which is that children owe their elders a debt of life for having been given a body at birth. And the debt of life, people talk about that it used to be paid in the home um, in sort of more familiar and traditional ways. I'm using this word tradition a lot, but that's because people talk about it a lot in Thailand, which is um, that they used to feed people and to give them herbal medicines. And there was sort of a local doctor, but all of this was happening in the home. But as, the, um, as Thailand has built up its super high-tech medicine, 
the debt of life has moved to the intensive care unit as the optimal or sort of supercharged place to pay back the debt of life. And people talk about this phrase that, that they owe a debt to their elders, and they talk about it in a very material way, where they received bodies at birth that were a fusion of material components of their parents' bodies. And so the debt that they owe is not just a filial piety kind of debt of connection and love and or even some sort of abstract notion of family. It's a very material and bodily debt that has to be paid back in due with the same kinds of objects. So with the first family that I took care of in the intensive care unit in Thailand, who was describing this debt to me, when I was confused about it, I said, well, so what does this have to do with the intensive care unit? And they got out a piece of paper and they broke down the body into the four components of matter that make up the sort of Vedic elements of um, the material world, which are earth, air, fire, and water. And they broke it down into the parts of the body, which were flesh, flesh blood, breath, and warmth. And they started to fill out this table for me of the components of medical technologies that they were using in the intensive care unit that were paying back these components of the body. And um, when I was asking about, you know, how is this a material debt that was incurred just by birth, people often talked about how the most important component of life that is infused itself with a kind of like accumulated spiritual power in that same transduction type way we talked about is blood itself. And in Thailand, um, I actually think in, in lots of places, it can be really interesting to, um, to study what nicknames people call their children um, because you get all of this kind of like inside view into domestic life. And anyway, in Thailand, one of the nicknames people call their children is my little blood clot. And my little blood clot is kind of a dual reminder. It's a form of intimacy, like you are part of my body, you are part of my blood, like we are so connected that my blood runs through your veins. But it's also a reminder because children are made in a lot of the sort of, um, the, the, the stories of how kids get born and are made. Children are made out of a blood clot from the mother and a blood clot from the father. And that is this material, physical, and spiritual debt that incurs this huge um, burden that needs to be paid back. So calling somebody my little blood clot is also, it's intimate, but it's also a reminder, like you owe me. You owe me for the ultimate debt, which is blood, which is my body. Um, so people need to get to the ICU to pay back uh, this debt of life. It has become sort of the optimal place to do this, or for lots of people, the most supercharged, powerful place to pay back this debt of life. At the same time, dying in the hospital is a terrible idea. And that is because the hospital is a polluted metaphysical space that is haunted by unhappy spirits that are generated by bad deaths and bad deaths are cr created when somebody dies while they still have unresolved business with the living that makes them cling to this life and stick around to try to resolve that unresolved business by involving themselves into people's lives and getting the living to do the work of the dead in some way. So Thailand has um, fabulous cinema. I see that Eric White is in the audience here. Eric White is a, um, a, a uh, uh, Thai, Thai cinema expert. And he's teased me before for saying that Thai movies are bad, but I'm mostly talking about Thai boxing movies. But anyway, Thailand, Thailand has this fabulous cinema and one of its genres are horror films. And almost all horror films have a scene that starts in a hospital because the hospital is where the bad deaths happen. And actually as a figure that we might talk about when we get to Professor Langford's work, the first victim of the ghost attacks are almost always the medical intern who represent Western rationality. And they have like drifted away from their ability to understand and have a sense for um, the other worldliness of things because they have overfilled their brain with the facts of life. So, um, this image I'm showing you here is actually a poster that was shown to me by a medical student who was my co-medical student when we were going out to a med school rotation out in a rural hospital outside of Chiang Mai. And it was his proof 
that the place we were going was a place that we should be terrified of. And you can see here, this is like a little filmic technique thing here, but in this movie, um, you know, the, this poster has this sort of sepia tone, this kind of evil green brown tone to it. And that's actually how these hospitals look because they're so humid and they have concrete walls and all the walls kind of mold over time and there's not very many windows. And so it has this actual, this is actually much more realistic than you might imagine. Um, okay, I'm getting carried away here. I have to go a little faster in my talk. So we want to get to the hospital to pay back this debt of life, but we don't want to die in the hospital. The home is sort of the opposite kind of place from the hospital. And here I'm creating these archetypes of home and hospital. And we'll get in a moment to how much place is really specific to actual places, not to these ideas of ideal types of places. But if I make this ideal type, the home is the opposite of the hospital. It has been filled with a life full of, of spiritual power generating activities. And a lot of these activities are part of what has long been the ignored, um, what people have talked about as the feminist, feminine side of Buddhism. As a long lineage of mostly white men showed up to Asia to study Buddhism and mostly studied with other men who were monks, creating this vision of Buddhism that was all about the monastic system and very formal forms of power, ignoring the kinds of activities that generate a huge amount of merit and spiritual power that happen through daily life, through caregiving, through making food, through raising children, through love, and through kindness in all of these um, more ordinary ways that have been less visible to religious studies scholars. So the house has been full of that stuff for a long time. It has also been absent of bad deaths because people have only had good deaths there. So there's this kind of um, feedback cycle of types of death that happen in places. And you'll see in this photograph here, there's a woman that I spent some time with in the intensive care unit, and then she was taken home after um, some of that treatment. And here she is on a mattress on the floor of her living room. And that is intentional because the job of everybody involved is to be present so that there is this festive and full atmosphere full of all the people who you might miss at the last moment of, of death. And around the head of her bed are all of these bags of her pos favorite possessions, again, so that she doesn't miss cling to anything at the moment of death, because just like in the hospital where there are bad deaths that generate spirits with unresolved business with the living. The goal at the deathbed here is to make sure that there's nothing sticky that would stick to her spirit and then make her cling and become that kind of spirit that we had talked about. So if we need to get to the hospital, we need to go into, light, into intensive care, meaning go on to life support and onto machines that keep the body alive past death. But then we need to make it home to die in the right place. This sets up this sort of wildly precarious situation, which is that we need to rush somebody home when they're either at the door of death or sort of past it in a precarious way. And this generates what is the title of the book, which is the Spirit Ambulance, which is this mad rush to get people home um, to die in the right place. So my job, unrequested, and I tried to, to push it away often, and we can talk a little bit about the ethics of research when you're both a physician and an anthropologist, but my job became to bag ventilate patients with their endotracheal tube to keep their spirit attached to their body on the journey home so that their spirit would make it to the right place before it separated from the body. And the spirit ambulance at the hospital where I worked, which was a which was a public hospital, and we can talk a little bit about universal health care and the access to all this stuff, um, was a pickup truck owned by the hospital gate guard, who normally was there to give information to people as they drove into the hospital and the arm of the, the gate entry gate would lift up after he would talk to them. He ran a side business where the nurses from the intensive care unit would call or text him and say, we have a patient who's at risk of dying soon and we need to get them home. And he would pull his pickup truck around back and we would load a patient in. We would switch them from mechanical ventilation from the life support machinery and onto an Ambu bag pump um, to pump air into their lungs. And he had outfitted his pickup truck with two oxygen tanks and a mattress 
that we would attach the oxygen tanks to the hand pumped um, ambu bag. And he also had on it, I don't know if you all can see my cursor, but there's this hook hanging from the ceiling. So if a patient was so precarious and at the edge of death that they needed blood pressure support medications known as pressors, then the bag of pressors could go with them and be hung in the, in the um, pickup truck to keep them alive. And the hospital guard had through a, a set of experience with his own experiences doing the spirit ambulance and also studying with monks in the Chiang Mai area who were experts in the metaphysics of the process of dying had figured out that the thing that seemed to make the spirit start to separate from the body was the beginning of the decay process of the body itself that made it an unhospitable environment and made the spirit wanna get far away from the body. So he had jerry-rigged out of a motorcycle tire pump and a high school chemistry beaker set and embalming apparatus, where if we were riding along in the spirit ambulance, rushing through traffic at breakneck speed, swerving through traffic, trying to get home in time, if the person in the back were to die along the way, we would suddenly stop and pull over to the side of the road. And he would use this large motorcycle tire needle to cannulate one of the large veins in the neck of the patient and use the motorcycle tire pump to pump embalming fluid into their body, which slowed the decay process and kept the spirit close to the body. And then the family would talk to the spirit to try to get it home. And they would say familiar things about how to go through the process of getting there. Like we're passing the 7-Eleven where you bought your cigarettes or we're passing the soccer field where you got beat up as a little kid is as familiar and specific as possible so that the spirit would um, know that this now newly mysterious and confusing environment of being disembodied, but floating near its now decaying body um, would become more familiar and it would be able to find the map home. And eventually we would get people home and um, I'll tell you the idyllic version of this just so you have a sense of it but you should know that it doesn't always go this well. We would get home and um, we would carry the person up into their house on this mattress. And this is the house of a one patient that we went especially far away. Um, this was a what, what would have been about a five and a half hour drive into the mountains outside of Chiang Mai. And we made it in about three hours because this was a, is a very precarious process. And when we arrived at this house, this is the next morning because I had to sleep there overnight. That, that opening of the house was just full of heads, of people from the family and from the village who had been alerted by cell phone that we were getting close. And we carried this woman up into her house and people had prepared food for her and gave her bites of her favorite food. And they had all of the equipment there for a very structured specific ceremony um, that is best translated as a forgiveness ceremony where people ask for forgiveness for things they might've done wrong and ask, um, and, and, and forgive for wrongs that they feel like they've had so that they can undo all of that possible sticky stuff between everybody before the spirit is supposed to move on to its next journey. So why did I tell you all of this? This isn't just like a summary of the book. This is about a specific thing that I think would be interesting to take us into today. And so I'm gonna bring us back to this idea of transduction of form. And I don't wanna to get too attached to what is material and what's immaterial and what's physical and what's metaphysical. But you can see that in this process, the hospital has gotten totally pulled in, in all of its fine grained detail into a kind of transfer between different forms. So that this thing that is kind of bodily and kind of physical and kind of spiritual that is the blood or that is the breath of a body, but that has also been a thing that has been able to accrue, that has been able to accumulate all of this spiritual consequence and power and interaction over life is now being transferred and it's being done through the technologies of this biomedical hospital that have gotten pulled into this interaction. And some of those things are actual life ob objects like blood transfusions and food mixtures through nasogastric tubes. And, um, and some of them are about modifying bodies like through surgeries and through, um, through medications that are IV medications. But some of those things are also the technologies of the ICU themselves 
that have become in kind of a cybernetic way, parts of people's bodies and have gotten recruited and deployed into this whole exchange that is moving power through different types of forms, some of them material, some immaterial, some spiritual, et cetera. Okay. I wanna move now to an even less intuitive for me component of this exchange. And that is that some of this stuff becomes part of people themselves. And this is something that, and I'm, I'm noticing a few Thai studies folks in, and I'd love to hear because we've had many arguments and conversations about whether this is something that is really true in Thai Buddhism or something that's unique to critical illness and the kind of falling apart of the body and the mind that happen right towards the end of life. But what I wanna talk about next is about how people are not only just themselves, but are made up of these hybrids of many things, including other beings. And I think the best way to do this is actually to start through a story. And I'll get in a moment to why there's a buffalo on the screen. Don't get too worried about this. Um, but this is a story about a man named Mahu who shows up in the book. Um, and he had, when I met him, he had invasive rectal cancer. Um, and I'm not gonna get into this talk into disclosure and an ethics around disclosure, but he, nobody really talked explicitly about how he had cancer. Um, it was all done in these sort of veiled ways that the Thai language allows to talk about a mass and a tumor and a disease and an intestine disease and all these things. But regardless, I think of invasal, invasive GI tumors as incredibly painful processes. This wasn't just a tumor that stayed in its spot and then maybe metastasized to other places. It was eating its way through his abdomen. And I had actually first recruited him in the hospital where I had um, been able to see some of his scans and see what it was doing to his insides. But despite that, he was this really jolly, seemingly happy guy. And I got to ask him eventually, once I got to know him well, I said, how are you coping so well with your illness? It seems like a very severe illness. And he said, it's because my disease is my karma master. And for the Thai studies folks in the, in the room, that, the translation for that is jiao gum nai wain, but I won't go into sort of the components of that. And he said, I said, what on earth is a karma master and how does that help you with the pain of an invasive rectal tumor? And he said, when I was younger, my whole life, I raised water buffalo and I used them for work. And in order to move them around and get them to do what I wanted them to do, I put rings through their noses and I attached a cord to the ring and I pulled their head from side to side to make them go the direction I wanted. And when I was first in the hospital getting diagnosed with this, I had a tube into my nose. And every time I turned my head, it yanked on my nose, just like I yanked on the buffalo. And that's how I know that my disease is the buffalo who have come back to work out this old relationship with me. And I harmed them in the past. And this is such a good opportunity for me to work out that old relationship before I die. And also I used to ride the buffalo all the time. And now my legs are bowed outward. And he stood up at the table where he's standing and his legs were bent outward like closed parentheses. And he said, and now I have pain in my hips and pain in my knees. The buffalo are my karma master. Come back to work out this old relationship with me. The term for karma master has embedded in it. It has these four words and it has embedded in it the, the, the words for the owner of something or the master of something, but it also has that embedded in it the idea of paying back a debt that you owe this karmic debt that you have to burn off. You have to pay this old debt. And so it is a creature that you have wronged in the past who is coming forward and is giving you the chance to pay back this debt. So he said, every morning when I'm feeling pain, I sit and I ask the buffalo for forgiveness and I forgive them for coming here and causing me pain. And because I know this is an opportunity, then I don't suffer so much from this. Okay, so this though, we're just, you know, we're going to a place where I'm gonna start talking about all these things like complex personhood and hybrid 
you know, we're, I'm going to get into some, some complicated conceptual stuff that I think is hopefully going to be a good connection to talking about Dr. Langford's work. So um, that story, it's sort of unclear whether the, what are the buffalo? Like, what's the status of the buffalo here? How exactly are they coming back and doing this? He doesn't really give us a roadmap for this. But I'm going to propose a, in stories of a couple other people a way of thinking about this. And the best way for me thinking about this is the story of, um, of a man who actually wasn't at the end of life, um, but I, who I met in a later project um, more recently on chronic pain. And I met him um, through a whole um, series of things, but mostly due to being connected with him for his pain because he had chronic severe neuropathic pain of his right arm after a motorcycle accident. And he also was paralyzed in that arm. So when I first met him, I asked him to tell me the story of how he got injured. And I expected him to just talk up mechanically about an, an injury, but he started much earlier than the injury, long time ago, earlier in his life when he was a teenager. And he started the story by talking about his personality as a teenager, which is that he was this sort of wild young kid. And he had all these friends in the, in the neighborhood. And he was kind of the clown that entertained them. And he was the most popular. He was also super handsome and all the girls wanted to date him. And um, he, but he was just kind of a jerk. And so one of the things he used to like to do to make everybody laugh is he would take one of the stray dogs from his neighborhood and he would pull the stray dog onto his motorcycle. And the dog obviously didn't like this and was scared. And so he would ride the dog around and bank around turns and the dog would squeal and then everybody would laugh. And it always went well until one day, he, his arm holding the dog slipped while it was squirming. And the dog fell off of the motorcycle and skidded and was clearly injured and limped off and then was no longer seen in the neighborhood. And then many years later, now just a year or two before I met him, he was riding his motorcycle at night. And he'd had a little bit to drink, but he wasn't drunk. And it was a dark night and it was full of fog from a storm. And he was banking around a turn in the fog and not able to see very well when a dog bolted out of the forest and clipped the edge of his motorcycle, or maybe he swerved, but either way, he hooked the tire of his motorcycle on the edge of the road and he went down and he landed on the side of his neck right here and skid very far along the pavement. And the pavement pulled his shoulder from his neck and ripped all of the nerves of his neck. And he came to a stop and realized suddenly that he had this horrifying pain in his arm and also couldn't move it at all. And he was so shocked and sort of injured from this that he lay there all night waiting for the sun to rise. And all night he heard the braying and howling and barking of a pack of dogs in the, in the woods in the distance. And he said to me, this injury was the dog who had come back to punish me and to work out the old relationship of what I did to it that long time ago. And now the dog comes to me in my dreams. And sometimes the dog is chewing on my arm from the outside, but sometimes it's like the dog is inside my arm. It's like my arm is the dog. And then all day long, I feel like I have dog in my arm. And my, my arm is like the teeth of a dog chewing. Okay. So. We're building here a model of people where people are so ethically entangled with the other beings that they have interacted with in the past that those be beings are able to come forward. And we're going to get to some ideas that I think would be very helpful from Dr. Langford's work that I wish I had used in my book for thinking about that coming forward but some version or some force or some effect from that being with which they interacted in the past comes forward and is able to become, in some cases, part of their environment, part of their scenario, part of their situation, 
in the intensive care units, some of those things become part of their body in the firm form of nasogastric tubes and blood transfusions. And then in this case of our man with the dog in his arm, there is some kind of dog entity in his arm that has come back and become a type of hybrid personhood. So one question I have for you all in this group is, in Western ethical theory, we are so bound, we are so attached to this idea of individuals as contained within themselves, so much so that we can build the big theories of Western analytic philosophical ethics out of it. Even virtue ethics, where what you do as an individual is cook a nature that can then interact with environments out there in the world over time, or in more sort of classic billiard ball people with desires and interests running into each other and advocating for themselves against other people's interests that we come up with in things like even utilitarianism, which is collective, etc. All of the theories of Western ethical theory require us to have individuals because without individuals, we can't do the stuff around decisions and values and assigning of autonomy. And okay, so what happens when every person is already always partly another person that they have become ethically entangled with? And their own wounds, their very illness, the very thing that we are trying to interact with with medicine to heal in them or relieve in them their very wound is a kind of ethical wound that is already entangled with another being. What do we do with our medical ethics when that happens? So the thing I'll propose today, and I'm looking at time here, I think we're, Priscilla, am I still good on time? Okay, we've got a thumbs up from Priscilla. So the thing that I'll say is that the way that I came to understand this in Thailand is what became the sort of overarching theoretical and just structural structure of the book, which is the concept of choreography, which is this set of actions that happens in time and in space to bring all of the most appropriate or beneficial elements that one can find together into a single configuration at a moment in time. This is what people were doing at the deathbed in Thailand. They were, as best as possible, taking care of the place where death could happen. And it was partly because of the things that inhabited those places. So if possible, you wanted to not die in a hospital because it was full of unhappy spirits and evil forces that had accumulated over time. So it was gonna be hard to assemble the right components to what should be in the room if you're in the hospital. And, but it's not the only way that you could craft what is in the room. It's not like things are just totally fixed in rooms. In fact, part of what you can do is pay attention to all the relationships with the other elements that are in the room. And so when we got our woman home and carried her up into our house, everybody was ready to do the forgiveness ceremony, which meant that everybody that was in that room at the moment of death was going to improve their relationship with the person who was dying. They were going to take those elements, those entanglements with one another, with other beings that were all going to be linked to the outcome of this death and work on bettering those relationships. So the choreography was try to get all the good stuff in the room, the good relationships, the good objects, the, you know, the things you want around. And then for the ones that you are there for in the last minute, maybe you should work on your relationship with those so that they are more positive components. The reason that that's helpful is because it allows one to think about ethical action without requiring individuals. And I'm gonna tell you a story that I think will make this clear. And this is the story of a man who in the book I call Pote. And we were at a meditation retreat together in Thailand. And um, we were, he was a middle-class professional. He was a dentist. Um, and we were both just sort of part of the same meditation community. And we were roomed together at this retreat. 
And so over the retreat, we got to know each other pretty well. And then I got to know him afterward. And when I first met him, he, um, he shared with me, I think because of, I was a medical professional and also because of the context of the retreat, he shared with me that he had suffered from what he called mild schizophrenia since he was a teenager. And he said, but it's totally not disruptive to my life. I'm highly functional. It's controlled on real low dose antipsychotics and everything's good. All very medicalized. And I was surprised and impressed that he shared this with me. And so I just sort of acknowledged it and we moved on. And then later, after he learned what my work was about, he said, okay, now I know you well enough and I know your work so I can tell you what's actually going on, which is that I know with 100% certainty because of a dream I have that I killed a man in my past life. And the voices in my head are actually his voices that in that moment, in that act of killing him, we got entangled. And now I know that it's him. I have gotten to know him and we've developed a good relationship. And that's why my mild schizophrenia is in good control. And I had, we would gotten to the point in my work where now I really wanted to just ask him the question that I really needed to know about all this. And I said, are they your thoughts or are they his thoughts? And if they're his thoughts, is he like in there in your head? And you're like, where is he? What is, I wanted to know the concrete metaphysics of this. And, I, and I'm going to get there in a moment with Professor Langford's work about, about my doctorly desire to make all of this very clean and concrete, which I, well, I'll get to why I think her book doesn't, do, doesn't make that mistake. So he, he, he said, well, you ask me, are they my thoughts or are they his thoughts? And the truth is, neither set of thoughts are really belong to anyone. They're just there in there. And it doesn't matter whose they are, but I know exactly what I need to do. I need to forgive him. I need to ask for his forgiveness. I need to love him. I need to treat him well. I need to ask that he does the same thing to me. And if he doesn't, I need to forgive him. We just need to go about the business of doing the right thing and treating each other well and treating ourselves well. And throughout this monologue, he used this pronoun in Thai, and I don't think he used it in this exact philosophical way. There's a pronoun in Thai where people will, especially sort of middle-class folks when they're speaking poetically, will use the term we, sort of like a royal we to refer to themselves. But in this monologue, it means that in my transcript of it, I can't tell who he's talking about at any moment in this monologue. He just says we all the time about him and this man he killed and the voices and it's all we. I'm not claiming that that is like this deep linguistically tied unsettling of the nature of personhood, but maybe it's not, not that. Okay. This is where I'm gonna stop talking about my own work, but I'd like to say a few words, if this is okay, Professor Langford, for me to take us a little bit into the overlap between our work. So um, I highly recommend reading Professor Langford's book, Consoling Ghosts. It is absolutely gorgeous. It's just like, you know, it's full of poetics of many different kinds. Um, and I would like to bring up, I, I know I'm not supposed to like do commentary on my own book for, um, using somebody else's work, but I wanted to bring up two things that I'm hoping we can talk about. I don't know if we'll get there. And they're both about how, even though it's very abstract, I just told you all this very clean and in some ways very idyllic story about how this all is put together in Thailand around the forms of complex personhood and the choreogra choreography of the end of life. And in my field work, it was really a lot like that. And it is supported by lots of forms of ontological stability, for lack of a better term, in Thailand of um, people having plenty of resources through universal health care and people, for the most part, living nonviolent lives in the folks that I studied, et cetera. So I'm hoping we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about what happens when a system like this enters a zone of, of severe instability. And um, 
I want to read a, a, a quote. Hopefully I'm not stealing your thunder, Dr. Langford, for a quote from your book, but I want to read a quote from, from Professor Langford's book. And this is from, this is from part of the chapter one, not the introduction, but chapter one, it's on page 25. Memories of violence are violent themselves, shot through re with repetitive terror, so immersive it can be difficult to surface. The memories are material and embodied as much as storied, partaking as much of the phantasmal as of the real. So here I'm, I'm pointing us towards the same kind of transduction of form between material and immaterial that is happening here in this formulation through memory. Um, and then Dr. Langford is going to go on and talk about a prominent character in the book. In particular, for Lieutenant Somsi and other emigrants, they are the memories of death and survival during the US-sponsored wars in Laos and Cambodia and their aftermaths. Memories that are embodied in recurrent nightmares, spirit encounters, soul loss, hauntings, and relations with the dead. All of these form the terrain of violent memories, which might better be termed traces. And I'd love to think about this idea of traces sort of similar to these um, things that I'm tracing that are moving between bodies and into contexts and that are being choreographed. Violent memories, which might better be termed traces, insofar as they are less narrative representations than sensate impressions, through which the spectral infuses the everyday, the dead call out to the living, and the past inhabits the present. Um, that's one thing I hope we will talk about where what happens, you know, these stories that I'm telling uh, about hybrid persons and about these medical contexts where people are finding themselves in these complicated cyborg-like um, mergers with medical technologies that are the instruments of spiritual consequences from prior entanglements with other spirits. What happens if those entanglements are themselves violent and chaotic and unknown and unresolved. Notice that Poet said, I know with 100% certainty that I killed a man in my past life and everything's okay because I've developed a good relationship with him. Everything sounds very stable and not very chaotic. Um, so there, I want to read one more quote, and this is from um, the afterword of Dr. Lanford's book on page 213. And it, it says, a ghost may shift from stranger to guest to kin, maybe a potential ancestor, a fallen ancestor, or someone else's ancestor. Ladwick has observed that in the Lao context, the vagueness of ancestral lore enables the imagination of all dead as possible ancestors, deserving of Buddhist compassion no less than hospitality. At the same time, one's own kin might not be securely ancestral, sliding toward potential ghostliness at certain apparitional moments. The dead might be conceptualized ultimately not as versions, but also as temporary, if recurring, coalescences, shifting assemblages similar to the Buddhist self playing loose with time. And I, 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 I use this quote because I, um, I feel like it points at something in the stories that I just told you about the concreteness and knowability of all of these deaths as they were told to me in Thailand, where for me, these Jiao Gum Nai Wain were mostly remarkable because people would def talk about them so definitively. Like, I know what my Jiao Gum Nai Wain is. It's a buffalo or it's a dog or it's the man I killed in my past life. And so what is it about these different contexts that might make the metaphysical mechanics of all of this coalescing and haunting and um, assembling into these scenes at the end of life, um, fraught with uncertainty and confusion and doubt. Um, okay, I'll stop there. And I'm gonna stop sharing our screen so we can see each other as we move forward here. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Why don't we just transition directly to Jean's comments? This was just 
really fascinating and you've actually done a wonderful job transitioning um, to her work as well. So let's just open up the dialogue between the two of you. And then afterwards we'll open up to uh, the wider audience for questions. So audience members, if you have any questions, please feel free to note in the chat either that you would like to ask the question yourself or if you're not in a uh, environment where you can ask, uh, feel free to type it in and we'll read it for you uh, to Scott and Jean. Thank you. Okay, wow, um, that is opening up beautifully. Some things that I wanted to talk about in my comments about uh, on Scott's book. Um, and then I also might go in a few, a few other directions. Um, first, I wanna say thank you to you Priscilla, Priscilla for organizing this event and also to Scott for writing this wise and incisive book. Um, one of the things I appreciate most about Spirit Ambulance is its linguistic richness. Uh, I was reminded early on of Walter Benjamin's Task of the Translator, where he writes that translation involves expanding and deepening one's own language by means of foreign language. And he imagines translation as calling into a language forest from its edge in order to hear in one's own language an echo of the original. So as Scott was translating terms like Kang Lung Chai or Quan, and please forgive my, my mispronunciations, I felt that we were poised at the edge of that Thai language forest where concepts like vitality and contentment or soul and spirit were not just expanded, but imploded by the reverberations from the Thai words. It was not just, for instance, that, that Kang Lung Chai uh, uh, unites qualities like quietude and energy that might be contrasted in European language, but also, or languages, I should say, but that it also goes beyond a sense of quality altogether to suggest a kind of substance that can be replenished or depleted. And when translated carefully, as, as Scott has done here, these expressions have the power to unravel deep-seated European assumptions about the nature of the self or the relationship between body and spirit, which tend to get transnationalized even in, within you know, the sort of structures of biomedicine. In a way, Benjamin's thoughts on translation also articulate an aspiration of ethnography. That is to allow our questions to be transformed, our concepts to be undermined, to be haunted by other ghosts as, as I feel that Scott was and, and drawn into other worlds not abstractly, but consubstantially. So uh, when Scott realized, for instance, that as a physician in Thailand, he carried not just technical expertise, but merit or boon that was transferred to others through his very presence. Um, I'm particularly struck by this Thai notion of stickiness. For instance, stickiness of karma, emotions, unsettled spirits that might cling to the winyan or the soul of the deceased. And, and Scott talked a little bit about stickiness in his, his preparation. A stickiness in which seemingly metaphysical effects take on physical viscosity has no easy corollary in the ontologies that govern most of the global north. Stickiness is related, you could say, to the transduction of form that Scott was talking about earlier. And this notion of stick stickiness also perfectly conveys the way that a clean Christian derived split between matter and spirit is of little use in understanding how Yun or Quan attach or detach from bodies. The idea of pukpun is similarly powerful, blurring love and duty in a way that's decidedly foreign for those modern liberal discourses that Beth Pavanelli, Beth Pavanelli called autology and genealogy, um, where autology refers to the personal freedom attributed to the modern subject and genealogy to the constraints of tradition attributed to cultural communities and usually you know, sort of non a European cultural communities. Love would belong to autology while duty would belong to genealogy, but Pukpan flies in the face of both, forcing us to consider a love that is no less heartfelt for being burdened with responsibility. As Scott was mentioning, uh, there are many 
many resonances in Spirit Ambulance with my work in the late 1990s, speaking with elderly Lao and Khmer Americans about death and shadowing hospice nurses and visits to Asian American families. And there are also tangible differences, some of them having to do with um, what he was, that chaos that he was talking about. Um, and certain, some of that chaos generated by um, the histories of the people uh, that I was talking to, and a lot of it generated by the way that US hospitals just aren't conducive to um, accommodating the different ontologies um, of, of people who suddenly arrive here from, from elsewhere. Um, so as Scott demonstrates the, and, and talked about today, the deployment of end-of-life protocols and technologies in Thailand has been inventively reshaped by Buddhist metaphysics. And it was really wonderful to read uh, all the ways that biomedicine became transformed in that setting. And incidentally, the most intriguing instantiation for me of this was that innovation of the ambulance driver that Scott was talking about earlier, who's prepared to inject embalming fluid in anyone who dies during transport. Uh, in order to keep the winyan from straying too far from the body, which, as Scott was saying, invokes this connection between decaying bodies and unsettled spirits, which is which is also ritually relevant in in animistically derived reburial practices in various parts of Southeast Asia. Um, in any case, if Thai medical practice incorporates a Buddhist metaphysics, U.S. hospitals during my field work and probably still today continue to be dominated by Christian, primarily Protestant presumptions about life, death, and afterlife. Not that anyone in medicine would actually say this to you because as far as they're concerned, it's all purely secular, but this secularism bears a lot of traces of Christian uh, uh, conceptions. So for instance, in the US, there was a similar disconnect between temporalities of dying um, to the one that is glimpsed when Scott's interlocutors originally assumed he wanted to speak to people who were within a day or two of death. Um, but in the US, there was little attempt on the part of hospitals to accommodate or even grasp the alternative temporalities of, of Southeast Asian patients. And, little chance of any shared understanding among medical staff and families about the logic and timing of shifting from life prolonging interventions uh, to death at home. And hospital pr protocols rarely facilitated any graceful choreography, and I love that idea of, of choreography for this, uh, for the departure of the winyan from the body, based as those protocols were in a uh, Christian assumption of a relatively rapid uh, and absolute separation of body and soul. So as a result, many Southeast Asian families were left to worry about whether the medical staff had actually done all they could for the patient, especially given that refugee camps, racialization, and poverty meant that institutional permission to die was nothing new, right? So it, also in the US, there was the same risk we encounter in spirit ambulance that disclosure of a terminal prognosis might weaken the quan or even drive quan from the body. It was the same concern that the patient might think too much um, if told their, their prognosis and the same acute awareness of the performative power of words an awareness typically missing from bioethics committed as it is to a representationalist understanding of language where words signify reality rather than shape it. Unlike their Thai counterparts, however, most US medical staff were no more able to grasp the poisonous potential of their speech than they were to comprehend the polluting atmosphere of hospital space. In the US also, Lao and Khmer Americans placed treasure possessions on the dying person's bed, but there, more animistic types of explanations of this practice often prevailed over doctrinally Buddhist ones, uh, with elderly Lao and Khmer insisting that the deceased would need passports, money, and cigarettes in their journey or in their next life. 
And when some young Khmer Americans tried to convince their mother that it didn't matter if the funeral home removed the coin from their father's mouth before cremation, since the coin was only symbolic, the mother countered, no, that means you lied. The importance of place to ritual performance was also a theme in the US, except that there it was not just the hospital that was inadequate for ceremonies, but the continent itself often. It was not so much that monks were less knowledgeable, though that might be the case, or ingredients less available, but rather that in some subtle but insurmountable way, it seemed that the US was simply an inhospitable place where few Lao or Khmer souls would want to linger. So for all these reasons, it gave me hope to read the, the coda of uh, Scott's book, where he talks about how his practice in the US was changed by his time in Thailand. It's really hard to overemphasize, too, the importance of his call for a situational bioethics rather than one based on static principles. Uh, inspired by ethicists in nursing, I've come to think of this as a narrative ethics, you know, an ethics sensitive not just to the patients, circumstances at the end of life or the trajectory of their illness, but to their story. And this seems close to the approach that, that Scott took with an American family in Lakota when he asked them about their father's life in order to broach the idea of disconnecting him from life support. One final theme that was familiar with uh, from my research in the US was the difference between a Christian derived confessionalist end of life introspection oriented toward an artic articulation of feelings and a meditative end of life introspection oriented toward the observation of the mind. The latter was not actually practiced by anyone I met in the US, but it was held as an ideal by some Lao and Khmer with whom I spoke. Foucault, of course, famously called confessionalism an individualizing tactic designed to produce the truth of the individual himself. In a confessionalist end of life introspection, the truth of the self that a dying patient is asked to confront is their terminal prognosis. Whereas in a meditative introspection, the truth of the self seems to be rather its ephemerality, its temporary coalescence out of fleeting thoughts and sensations. And we might even call this the truth of the non-self, quoting uh, Tote, um, one of the interlocutors that, that um, Scott was talking about earlier. I was especially gripped um, by that final chapter on karma masters where, as Scott puts it, people, quote, choreograph their deaths, not just as individuals, but as entangled combinations of multiple entities. Um, and I'm so grateful that Scott told the story of the Buffalo karma master and the man whose karma master was a dog and so on, or maybe more than one dog, because, you know, whether or not you've read the book, you now have a sense of just how concrete these karmic entanglements are multiple partable distributed persons might pose the greatest challenge yet to bioethics as we typically know it. And as Scott writes, quote, if bioethics is deeply dependent on autonomy as a concept, it is even more dependent on the idea that people consist only of themselves. I love how he puts it there. You know, it's not, <laughs> it's, it, it really broadens out our sense of what we're doing when we turn people into individuals. Anyway, the questions Scott raises here reminded me of the questions that Alan Klima asked about the gift and about karma in the funeral casino, uh, and even before I realized that Scott was, was citing him there. If selves are multiple and metamorphic, who actually gives a gift of boon or merit, and who receives it? Who's, who produces karma and who experiences its effects? These questions get really thorny. Scott describes Derrida's ontology as, quote, an approach to social life that examines how ideas or things appear at different times and in different places in slightly different form, leaving a true nature that is ultimately empty or ambiguous, end quote. I would probably describe ontology in somewhat different words, maybe as marking an absence at the heart of being, which itself emerges out of processes of differentiation, that endlessly refer and defer, forever postponing any possibility of self-coincidence. But nonetheless, I share his sense of a similarity between ontology and a Buddhist notion of self. 
I was less sure about the distinction that he draws between Buddhist selves that are merely impermanent and selves that are composed of other entities. I've always read Klima as saying that the self encountered through meditation or affected by karma is discontinuous, or to use Scott's term, non-continuous, and not just constantly changing. Of course, this interpretation renders the notion of accountability from one life to another profoundly paradoxical, but isn't that part of the point? Um, it seems equally paradoxical for someone to be both composed of a dog and in debt to a dog, or maybe more than one dog, as, as Tote describes himself in the final chapter. With partible and distributed selves, in other words, paradoxes seem to abound. Whatever the resolution of this conundrum, or maybe the non-resolution, um, Skite insightfully follows the thread of non-self to ask a further question that I really love. How can one navigate death when one is always already partly the other, unquote. It's such a critical question, but almost immediately I was seized by another question relevant to anyone dying anywhere with or without karma masters. And that is, who is the subject that undergoes death? At one point in the final chapter, Scott turns to the opening passage of Lisa Stevenson's beautiful book to recount the story of a raven who lives behind an Inuit family's home and who may or may not be their deceased uncle. This is, as Scott says, partly related to Inuit naming practices whereby newborns are given the names of deceased relatives. But for Stevenson, the raven is also a figure for productive uncertainty, wherein, quote, something stubbornly remains even as it refuses to be neatly resolved, unquote. And she goes on to ask, quote, what, for example, does it mean to be dead? And what does it mean to know something? Scott writes really insightfully about knowing and not knowing earlier in Spirit Ambulance. He, he didn't talk about that part, but you know, hopefully you, if you haven't read the book, you will be soon. Anyway, he's contemplating in that passage how it might be possible to both know and not know that one is dying. But riffing off Stevenson's questions, I wonder if we might shift the question into a different register beyond terminal prognosis to a wider realm of knowing. What if it is only possible to not know that one is dying or only possible to not know death? In the same way that it might be only possible for Tote to not know whose disturbing thoughts he is having when under the influence of his karma master. As I read this chapter, I was reminded of Derrida's insight in Aporia's and elsewhere that one's death is always the death of an other, insofar as we are other to ourselves in death, and insofar as experiencing another's death may be the closest we come to experiencing our own. That is, none of us experience our own death, even if we might be said to experience moments leading up to it. It might be as impossible, therefore, to own one's death as it is taking inspiration from the accomplished meditator and spirit ambulance to own one's body, or taking inspiration from Tote, uh, the man with the disturbed thoughts, to own one's own heart mind, the chit chai. What if death itself is in question? How might we, scholars, doctors, bioethicists, acknowledge that when we speak of death, we really don't know what we're talking about? That death is precisely that which eludes our grasp. Some years back, David Armstrong compared the proliferation of discourses about death to the proliferation of discourses about sex as discussed by Foucault. Death, like sex, Armstrong argued, was not so much repressed over the course of the 19th and early of early 20th centuries in Europe as transformed into an object of expert knowledge involving intensive documentation ranging from terminal prognoses to biological definitions of death, death certificates to autopsy reports, mortality statistics to self-help self -help books on bereavement. And maybe we should throw in ethnographies of death like Scott's and mine and many others. How might we infuse a little not knowing into this flood of knowledge? How might we remind ourselves and each other of the enigma of death? And in that admission of mystery, perhaps be a little less confident that we know what death is, let alone how it should be faced. So 
after throwing out that probably unanswerable question or cluster of questions, um, I just want to conclude by thanking Scott again for this wonderful and provocative book. Thank you. Those were just absolutely fabulous comments. Priscilla, what do you want to do? I, I think we're a little short on time. Should, can I respond or should we do some questions from the audience? I, I would love to have questions from people. Well, why don't we do this? I mean, the time is scheduled, uh, ends at, uh, in 15 minutes. So we have 15 minutes for your comments and any questions in the audience, but why don't we give you time, a few minutes to respond to Jean's beautiful uh, comments and insights. And then anybody who would like to is welcome to stay as long as Scott uh, and Gina are able to stay. And we can also type the questions in the chat so that you'll have them as reference. And uh, you can also leave your email if you have to go, but you're dying to know, uh, maybe not literally dying to know uh, the answer, then maybe Scott can respond uh, by email as well. So why don't we just do that? And uh, it'll formally end at 10, but anybody who is, is able to is, uh, can stay longer. Uh, also, I just wanted to just check with everybody if it's okay to continue recording. If not, please send me a message uh, privately and then we can stop the recording at any time. I'll turn things over to Scott. Great. So, Jean, I was hoping to, um, you had so much rich material in there, and I was thinking I could pull a couple of threads together actually into a question for you. And this is about um, the writing in your book and also just the way you formulated it now in your question around Foucault's concept of the confession and confessional technologies. So for folks who um, haven't read the book, and I didn't talk about this in this talk, because I just picked this little thread to draw through, um, there's a section of the book that is a, um, all of these trainings that people have begun to do around how to approach the end of life in a way that will um, further their own enlightenment and their own spiritual development. So these are healthcare providers, but also patients and people who go through these series of trainings. And when I was first in the trainings, I was just thinking Foucault the whole time, like confessional, confessional. And the reason is because there were these components of these trainings that were really um, a rupture from Thai social norms. Um, so often there's a, there's a, there's a sense, this is a very sort of glib summary, but in there, there's, Felicity Aulino has written very beautifully about this, about how there's this assumption in public spaces in Thailand that um, displaying negative emotions is um, somehow doing harm to others. And it's, it sort of fits into the same idea of kind of like choreographing a collective of what's in the room, that like bringing those things and giving them more reality and also the ability of words to make reality that Jean, you were talking about very beautifully. Um, and so the idea of like talking about how you're feeling is just really uncomfortable for a lot of my Thai friends. <laughs> so then they go to these trainings in which their job is to emote and to go through these trainings where they're having these pretending to be in these near-death experiences and learning to talk to patients about what they're feeling and to figure out like what is the heart of the thing that is most going to unlock somebody having this big emotional release, these things that feel very... Um, very contrary. And it sounded to me a little bit like when I was first going to these trainings, like the Foucaultian confessional, like the confessional provides this kind of like the, both a release of a, of a hydraulic pressure, but also like mm, it is in itself its own ethical act that, you know, in the Catholic confession that undoes the, that do, it undoes the, the evil of the act through the confession, right? But then as I went through the trainings, I realized that something else really different was going on there. And it had to do with this thing you're talking about, how to know about death and who dies and how do we know what death is enough to relate to it in a specific and real way. And I'm thinking a little bit of, you, you know, you mentioned that the folks in your study had as this sort of distant ideal, a meditative approach to end of life, but nobody was doing it. Um, I had a whole series of people in the field work and I tell some of their stories in the book where they had spent their whole life meditating and then, and trained and they had had all these stacks of books on their 
bedside table that was about like confronting death and death as the reality of life, you know, all these things that were about death. And then when it came to the end of their own end of life, all their family members were concealing their diagnosis from them and nobody was talking about it and they didn't seem to want to talk about it. And I would ask people about that and they would say, oh, all those books are just theory. Like the death is, it's a real thing that you can't have experienced yet. So you don't know how you're actually going to react and whether all that prep preparation will do anything. And so for this confessional, it was like, the confessional was, I can't tell if there was a Foucaultian stuff happening there or if it was like masquerading as a confessional, but it was really uh, more like, now I'm thinking, Professor Langford, about your work on Baudrillard and simulation and simulacrum and the way in which the thing you fake then becomes the reality by it making itself um, or it's like the map that makes the territory like you if you it's sort of if you build it they will come kind of thing that these trainings had much more of a theory of like let's try to simulate death as close as we possibly can because the closer we can get to simulating it the more we will make it a real real that you can then actually practice with um, so I wanted to ask you, that's sort of a, a, a jumble of all of your work, um, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you that about that chapter on those trainings. And I'll just have that be my one, my one comment and then we can move to questions from the, from the audience. But I'd love, I'd love to hear your answer. Oh, well. Wow, that's, that's very intriguing. I mean, it's hard for me to know what's going on there. Obviously, you know, um, I mean, there's a there's a Christian thread in that training that is being sort of imposed into an, a non-Christian space. And what, you know, I mean, from my experience of other situations like that, I would guess that there's got to be some very strange things going on that in the same way that the way that um, people use the, the high-tech biomedical technologies to actually enact, you know, the payment of debt, you know, that they have for their physical existence, you know, that, that there, there's probably some very innovative way that people are turning that, you know, so that they can simultaneously um, uh, um, accommodate uh, you know, the, the confessionalist modality while also sort of not really wholeheartedly swallowing the Christian understandings that, that come with it, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, I was just remembering the scene in Iowa Ong's book, Buddhist is Hi Hiding, where some Cambodian, some Khmer American women are shown a video of, uh, about, um, post-traumatic stress and when at the end of the video they say okay we we don't need any more counseling we're cured now you know <laughs> you know <laughs> because which is which was a nice way of deflecting any further attempt to force them to speak about what they went through under the Khmer Rouge you know um while also sort of very you know um, graciously accepting, you know, this, uh, this presentation that they were given. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's super helpful. Well, I'm aware of the time and that we only have a few minutes left for the formal present, uh, formal question and answer period. I wanted to let everybody know here that we will post the recording, we'll send it out to everybody who registered officially for the talk and also post it uh, on the event website uh, at chm.hku.hk. It's also listed in the chat uh, if you want to uh, refer to the recording afterwards. But uh, let's take two questions that were typed on uh, the chat at uh, maybe uh, first Eric White and then followed by Laura Meek and then hopefully Scott and Jean can respond together. And then for those of you who have to leave, we understand that the official time is over, but I uh, hope that we can continue these conversations virtually over other forms. Uh, so uh, Eric, would you like to ask your question directly? Sure. Hey, Scott. So um, I'm going to set aside the ontology and the metaphysics and the ethics. I want to ask a kind of a more nerdy ethnographic and historical question. And I was struck this, you know, hearing you talk this time, mentioning that the uh, you 
talking about the ICU is this optimal place for paying back the debt of life. Um, and it led me to think, so, you know, there's, they've, they've taken biomedical technology and techniques and incorporated it right into the logic of paying back the debt of life. So, you know, one question I have is, paying back the life in the ICU, right? Through this, through this incorporation of this, these techniques, is it distinct ideologically, socially, ritually from how you pay back life in other kinds of places, settings, times? Um, and then the other question is, is, you know, I mean, is this the a unique, incorporation of culturally foreign techniques of care and caregiving in the paying back of life? Or are there other precedents before this, right, in which Thai society has incorporated it, which would also raise a question of, you know, is this, is what's going on in ICUs similar, how is it similar or different from other, you know, kinds of incorporations of foreign techniques of care and caregiving? in terms of uh, the paying back of life. Thank you, Eric, for a, that's a fabulous question. Um, I'm gonna try for sort of a short, medium answer rather than the really long answer, because that was like I, I, full of stuff. Um, there's this old article by Niels Mulder that I, um, I love about different forms of power in Thai, sort of pr the pragmatics of Thai ritual life. Um, and he talks about them as these two different axes, or they're just sort of like separate types of power that people could broker, broker in. And one of them is a moral power that is generated through moral activity. Um, so that's the monks chanting and, the, and, the, and doctors doing caregiving and anytime you do loving kindness and when you give a gift and these acts that are explicitly formulated as moral in their nature. And then, the, and, and you do more of those acts and you can accumulate that power. And that's part of how monks like generate these amulets that are full of spiritual power that it accumulated. Um, and then there's this other axis of power that's like just pure amoral, it's not immoral, but amoral pragmatics that are like just how to get stuff done. Like this is the kind of thing that's, you know, how do you, you know, do well at the stock market? And how do you, you know, there's stuff that is, it's not, it's not immoral, it's not moral, it's just kind of like a different access of power. And the people that I was talking to in my field work talked about the technology of the hospital like that. There was this kind of fetishism of technology and, and, and money in a way that was sort of like the pragmatics of the economic and material and technological physical world that the ICU was like the supercharged ultra place for that. It was like where you go to get the most fetishized biotechnical embrace and the life support machine that costs all this tons and has all these gadgets and it was just like supercharged, right? But they would talk about it as in some ways in conflict with that other form of power. So there were families who would say like, you know what, the hospital has all this power. And they would say it, they would use the word power. Me, I'm not, right? Like the hospital has all this power. And then they would say, it's a different kind of power than the kind that's at home, right? And we kind of think in our family and with this balance and stuff, we're gonna, we're actually, I think we're gonna just get out of the hospital and be done with this part because we wanna go back to that other kind of power because we think that that familiarity and that, feminist side of Buddhism is just gonna be much more powerful. So I think that, you know, you this, this question you had about like, why is the ICU an optimal place? That's, you're right, that's totally the wrong word because optimal sounds like you're optimizing something and the optimal is actually about like, how do you balance that with the specifics of the person and what information they want and how comfortable they are in the hospital and whether they should be at home and what home is like and also the specifics of their disease and so like optimizing is really more like about choreography about how do you cook all the devils in the details to be the right combination um, and because of that you know 
when I'm giving a talk and I'm just go moving through it fast, I talk about the hospital as like the place that the debt of life is paid now, but it's more accurate to just talk about as like the supercharged, hyper technologized version of the debt of life that you then are kind of negotiating and deciding if you want to embrace. So the second half of your question about Thai society in general um, is a whole rabbit hole I would love to think much more about. But the short thing I'll say is that there's just so much writing and conflict and discourse in Thailand around the fetishization of technology and modernism and, um, and money. And, and it fits into that kind of axis and that debate a little bit. And in that way, the stuff about the ICU and the ICU get, gets pulled into all these politics that's about way more than that. That's about democracy and you know what is the form of the nation state and should we be and then all of the buddhist teachers like buddha dasa writing about how we're actually all getting less enlightened because we've gotten completely obsessed with technology and we're like getting farther and farther from the truths of nature and all of those conversations are all very related great uh, my colleague uh, hku laura Meek would like to ask a question as well Hi, thank you all uh, so much. This was absolutely a gripping talk and um, one of the most fascinating talks I've seen in such a long time. So thank you uh, both Dr. Stonington and Dr. Langford. Um, I'm actually gonna skip my question because I see one of my students has put a question in the chat and I can always grab you at AAA but she might not get a chance to ask you again. So Gigi, I see you're still here. Would you like to ask your question? Hi, thank you for the talk. I find it very fascinating. I have a question for Scott. I just want to ask uh, if you have any insight about how medicine is taught in Thailand, because clearly people at the hospital know what the what the location represents that so much so that the traffic coordinator even has, as you called like a side hustle, that he has like a separate gig that he does when people are nearing their death already. So is the Thai way of teaching medicine, the, uh, the same westernized way of the individual as contained within the individual, or are they also taught that when they're studying medicine? Or is it something that they get from the cultural side of just being in Thailand, something they hear from their family or they just experience? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great question, Gigi. Um, and Dr. Langford, I'd love to hear a little bit about about how people talked about medicine as a profession and its comparison to sort of seeing it in the US when people got to the US. But um, so the thing I'll say about Thailand is that, um, you know, we didn't, I didn't do much bioethics in this talk, um, but a first thing that is important to break to sort of as a foundation when talking about bioethics and medical education and that sort of thing is that, you know, a lot of the justification for the US's and Western Europe's ex at least explicit version of bioethical theory and bioethical practice, which are not necessarily the same as they actually happen on the ground, which we could talk about, um, is the idea that, that, they are, that those places are such pluralistic societies that one can't possibly have any assumed common ground of, um, of values, of, um, uh, of metaphysics and even of understandings of kind of justice and right action to be able to use consistently any other principles of bioethics other than autonomy. It's sort of this self-narrative that you you're forced into autonomy because when somebody walks in the door, you have no idea what they're gonna think or feel, right? Um, now, whether that's actually what generated the autonomy, we can argue about because it's actually, that's not my theory of, <laughs> that's not my understanding of what generated it. Um, but in Thailand, there's, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum is that in a place that is actually quite diverse, and there's a huge variety of different Buddhisms, and then not to mention languages and ethnicities and religions outside of Buddhism, and then there's, there are class differences, and now there are political differences that are just like ripping the country to shreds. And, you know, it is a super diverse, but there is a narrative of homogeneity. And the narrative of homogeneity it creates this constantly rehearsed idea that there is a common ground on which you can act and that under that common ground, you can justify a form of beneficence because you know enough about the person in front of you to take care of them 
even against or without asking what they, if, out, without asking them to have explicit input in it. So there's a lot of, in medical education in Thailand, I understand, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, sort of like, actually the best way to say it is like a simultaneous fetishization and cultural superiority to the West. That's like, okay, here's how Western biomedicine does it. And we're gonna learn bioethics, but we all know that the West, that the Americans like don't really understand the mind-body connection and that they need to like use data all the time to convince themselves that depression leads to poor outcomes in surgery. And like, we've got just like, we, we have a much better starting point here in Thailand for understanding the true nature of things. So they sort of like will present it tongue in cheek and then just start afresh with a whole different bioethics. Like, so here's how we're gonna do it. But there's not like a, really clear formulation of it in a classic Western philosophical analytic sense where they're like, okay, and here's how it's put together. And here are the principles that derive it. It's kind of like, oh yeah, we know, we all know how this works. We all know that if you tell the person that they have cancer, that they're going to die quickly. And we all know that if, right. So that it, it's like it, it the, the homogeneity narrative allows it to follow a parallel or shunt path without ever having to be explicitly addressed or formulated as needing to require a direct comparison. I don't know if, if that's a, a helpful answer to your question. Great. Uh why don't we take, um, I guess, I just want to check because Scott, I know it's 9 p.m. where you are and I uh, don't want it to go too late, but there are um, at least one other question on the chat um, from Gian uh, Pendry. I don't know if you would like to ask yourself. And we also have um, Serene Agnew, a social worker who had more of a comment. Uh, so if either of you would like to ask directly, uh, please go ahead. Sure, I guess I could go ahead and ask it. I was just curious, like what happens if, um, when people are unable to have all the forgiveness ceremonies, and then if someone does die in the hospital, do Thai hospitals try to accommodate allowing people to do the forgiveness ceremonies in the hospital itself? Yeah, great questions. Um, so I can answer both of those relatively quickly. So one is that, you know, partly because I'm a concrete thinker and partly because it's just like the only way I know how to write, I ended up writing this book in a relatively structuralist way, right? Where I lay out sort of the rules of the game and how it all works and how people explain it to me. But the, I, the idea of then weaving through that, this concept of choreography is that it's not really um, rule-based in a sense that it's like, if you break the rules, that something is going to go really bad. And the quick way to explain that is that there is a concept of a good death, and the concept of a good death requires the concept of a bad death, which means you could blow it, right? But a lot of what I saw was that the most important ethic was just trying really hard, right? Was that everybody just put as much effort as possible into moving this in the best direction they could. So if, for example, somebody died suddenly in a traffic accident and you didn't get to do the, I would think in this very rule-based ritual kind of imaginary that like, oh my God, the a component of the, of the good death didn't get to happen. Isn't this a bad death? And then people would say, well, actually maybe in this situation, um, this person actually had really good karma because they didn't suffer at all. And they died young before they got to all that stuff that's coming later with the, you know, the cancer and the pain and the suffering. And maybe they didn't even have a karma master at all, which is why it all just happened quickly. And there was nothing to resolve. Um, so the forgiveness ceremony didn't even need to happen. Or they might, you know, or it might become an unhappy ghost who haunts that part of the road because there was unsettled stuff, right? So it's like the devil's in the details of all the actual relationships, right? And it's also not just interpretive stuff that's laid on to a situation. There is also all this feedback from the spiritual world. So if somebody dies in a car accident 
and then there start being repeated car accidents at that same corner, it's like, okay, now we have evidence that there's an unhappy ghost there that's like grabbing people's wheels and making their cars crash. So maybe that death we thought was really good and a peaceful, simple death is now actually, we now have evidence that things are totally bad. And so it's, 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 it's very, um, it, you know, I, I, I love what Jean said about narrative ethics. It's like, it, it, it is a story in all of the color of its detail. Um, and because of that, it is a story that is being crafted and observed and known as it goes. So there's one scene in the book where I, where we get a, 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 a woman home and she wakes up from her general anesthesia in this horrifying pain and has this terrified look on her face and is screaming in pain and fear. Um, and then, and everybody's freaking out. What do we do? Do we take her back to the hospital? Do we call them to try to get some morphine, which they don't allow outside of hospitals? Do we, like, why is this happening? And then she suddenly passes out. And I say, just instinctively, I say, um, oh, that was just the anesthesia medications leaving her system. And every, there's like this collective sigh and everybody's like, oh, okay, that wasn't, her karma, that wasn't a real, that was just like, that was the medicine imposing that. And it was like, I didn't even think, I was just something I thought to say, but it had this like wild effect on the narrative of how it was all being put together and therefore the reality of what was happening to her spirit at that time. And then other things happened that changed it even more. So I don't know if that helps you. Well, I, that was the first, your first question. It sort of half answered your se second question. I just also wanted to say about the narrative ethics and just your power as a storyteller, Scott, and also Jean. I mean, both of you write such incredibly compelling ethnographies and the stories you tell really bring to life, literally, as well as death here or the nobility, just, you know, what is the texture of this? So I just uh, really want to say that both of your work is so beautiful. Uh, we are really running out of time, but we have one final question uh, that my HKU colleague Adrian Cam would like to ask. Uh, Adrian, would you like to ask directly? And then I guess we'll conclude the formal portion of this. And anybody else who would like to ask Scott and Jean questions, please do email them. You can Google and find their email addresses pretty easily, uh, or we're happy to collate and send them on. Yes, yeah. uh, thanks for your wonderful talk. Uh, just uh, as a ger gerontology graduate, I just want to uh, just want to uh, want to understand more about the the, the whole pro the whole model because uh, there are some different types of uh, end of life care model. But uh, I just want to know: is there any or so called services or anything that they can they can provide to the caregivers? Uh, uh, during the process and even after the even after the process, uh, how do how do they? Is there any ways that they can comfort the caregivers to, uh, and is that uh, intent is that tense uh, and and comfort their, their their feelings? Yeah, thank you for that. Thank so, you. Such a good question, and there's a whole there's a whole interesting sort of history and ethnography to be written of the arrival and. Um, and then evolution of palliative care and hospice movements in actually Southeast Asia in general, but in Thailand in particular. Um, and some of the context that I think is really interesting is that, that I don't really talk about much and I didn't actually write all that much about, um, which is despite Thailand having universal health care, it is a resource and wildly resource and labor limited system. Um, so just to give you a sense of this, the physicians that I spent time with, um, the oncologists in the main hospitals in Bangkok um, would see between 60 and 90 outpatients a day. And to just give you a sense for oncology, you know, this is cancer medicine. So you have to, um, you know, you have to do all of the molecular phenotyping of the tumors and look at all of the scans of all the patients and then diagnose the stage of the tumor and then prescribe the full chemotherapy regimen for each patient that you see in addition to physical exam and history. So if you calculate out to a day, that's like two minutes per patient. So these are just these like unbelievable machine, computer brain, genius people who are like, 
synthesizing data so fast. And you can imagine they are not like having a conversation with <laughs> about anything. And then the doctors in the rural hospitals that are like the community hospitals with way less acuity, but they're hospitals, they're rounding on, you know, between 50 and 80 inpatients a day, which means that by the time they get to, you know, the, the people die before they even get to rounding on them to talk about their case, right? So even though this is universal healthcare and it's this great healthcare system in many ways and the training is really good, and it's also just like really, really different and um, materially and structurally. So in Thailand, there's been a huge resistance to things like um, inpatient hospice or hospice facilities. And then there's been a huge, even though there's a push towards things like you know, home hospice care, it's all about these kind of large movements where people get trained to do their own care for their family members, right? So the, in the Spirit Ambulance, that the chapter on facing your death peacefully is, you know, a lot of that since then has expanded into these big trainings for hundreds and hundreds of people of like, how do you become a community member that goes and helps people for your own spiritual growth and your own, you know, loving kindness for the world that goes around in your community and helps people with this kind of hospice. So it's got this, it's got this sort of diffuse nature to it. Um, and partly, I think that's a little bit of why it has been so spiritual in its inflection, because that's how all the recruiting to get people to do this as free labor has happened, is this idea that only by getting really close to real death can you actually get ready for the, your own real death, which is like the central component to this process of, of spiritual progress. Um, is because you know if it was if it was framed as a technical skill that was a profession or a you know uh, then I think it that that the sense is that the, the the labor ranks would just be too thin. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. We've gone uh, pretty far over time, so I'm, I just wanted to conclude the formal portion of the talk really appreciate the time that uh, Dr. Stonington spent to share his work with us, uh, as well as Professor Langford uh, for your brilliant comments and both of you so insightful in terms of generating thoughts and uh, productive ideas here, uh, being rooted uh, in Asia and speaking to a pretty transnational audience today. Really appreciate the time that you chose. And thank you to all the audience members for engaging with us and taking the time. So thank you for coming and hope that we can continue these conversations in many different forms. Great, and thank you to Jean for reading and for commenting and then for all of your work that has just been so, so visionary for so long. I love your stuff, thank you. You're welcome and thank you for your book. And thanks Priscilla for, for organizing this great event. Thank you.